Good morning. It seems like yesterday uh, that the president and CEO of the Urban League of Greater Miami got a call from Hob Mogul, who is the president and CEO of the United Way of Dade County. And Hobbs said to me that there's a guy here named Jeb Bush. He just finished his campaign and he has some money left over uh, that he would like to donate to an agency in Liberty City that's doing something in education. Would you like for him to come and bring you a check? <laughs> so I said, is he on his way? <laughs> I called my PR person and said, Jeb Bush has a check for us. Get here quickly so that we can do the photo op and I can see if I can get some more checks from somebody else who has been struck by lightning. Uh, Jeb came over and we thought it would simply be a photo op. Uh, we chit and chat about things that were important to him, but not important to me. I just wanted to check. <laughs> but as we talked, uh, we found out that we were on the same wavelength. I found out that his father was tall and lanky, and my father was tall and lanky. Uh, his mother was short and dumpy and my mother was short and dumpy. Uh, he loved family, and I loved family. But we both believed uh, that education was the key. I believe that if we could uh, demonstrate that smart is something that you get, not something that you got, that we could shatter the myth uh, that the children of Liberty City could not learn. So as we talked, uh, he said, why don't we start a charter school? So I said, well, that sounds great to me, but what's a charter school? He explained to me uh, the value of, of us chartering ourselves on that course, and we set out to start a charter school. We found a building. We got authorized. We went all over the state uh, trying to convince Pat Tonella and others uh, the unions and others that it made sense. Uh, and finally, we were ready to go. We forgot one thing. We didn't have any children. Uh, so we immediately called a meeting of all of my mothers, and they came to a meeting on Saturday morning in the heart of Liberty City. Jeb, you remember that? We convinced them to loan us 60 children so that we could demonstrate beyond a shadow of a doubt that they could be smart. Well, you know the rest of the story. Uh, we became the first charter school in the state of Florida. Uh, and we demonstrated. <laughs> Thank you. Beyond a shadow of a doubt uh, that my children could learn. And I was excited about knowing Jeb Bush because part of my responsibility is to know all of the governors of the state of Florida. So from Leroy Collins, uh, to Reuben Askew, uh, to Bob Graham, to Lawton Childs, to Claudius Kirk, uh, you name it, I had a relationship with them. But I come this morning to testify uh, that given those relationships, there has been no relationship like the one that I have with Jeb Bush. He is indeed, as he says to me, a brother from a different mother. <laughs> he is indeed uh, my comrade in this battle. And I've always been impressed with him. And then we went to Nigeria. Now, can you imagine my first trip to the homeland? And I'm going with Jeb Bush. <laughs> I had some difficult times uh, trying to explain that to the NAACP and SCLC and other not understanding groups, uh, that it made good sense for me to go to Africa with Jeb Bush. 
And I was absolutely blown out of the water because he demonstrated an awesome ability to relate to the dignitaries in Nigeria. And at the same time as we marshaled our forces to go into the villages to relate to the chiefs and the other folks. So I said to myself, this is my man. Not only is he good in Liberty City, but he's good in the native land. Some folks would say that uh, he is one of a kind. I simply say he is the right kind at the right time. Uh, how do you introduce somebody that everybody knows? You simply say, Jabush, I love you. Come on up. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tal. Um, slightly exaggerated, but I'll, I'll take it all. There's only one problem you have if, uh, if uh, this has been taped and someone sends it to my mother. I don't want to be around when she sees that, nor do you. Wow. Just for the record, Mom, I think you're beautiful. It is good to be here at the ninth annual summit. I actually plan uh, not to be here this year. I hope to be pursuing a uh, different kind of public service. But as you know, Uber outsourced my job to a robot. So here I am. Seriously, I'm grateful to the board of the foundation for its work in my absence. I particularly want to mention Condi Rice, who served as chairman uh, for two years. There is no more eloquent, more elegant, more passionate, more informed voice in school, the school reform movement than Condi Rice. I thank her and all the members for the, for the work that they continue to do. I'm proud of the fact that we've built an organization that is really indispensable for many of the policymakers all around the country, other than North Dakota, apparently. <laughs> I especially want to recognize Betsy DeVos, who was, until today, a board member. <clears throat> what a phenomenal, strong woman. And she will do an extraordinary job as Secretary of Education. We all are looking forward to working with her, I know. We're lucky to have over 300 policymakers from all around the country and from more than uh, almost every state. We're going to work on North Dakota by the end of this. We'll maybe get someone to come from Bismarck. Uh, and we appreciate all that you do. My only advice, if you remember one thing, it's to be big, be bold, or go home. This is a time for big thinking and courageous leadership to encourage each other to to, to move the needle so that more and more children gain the power of knowledge in this turbulent world, this exciting world that we're living in. We're fortunate to have some really good speakers, hopefully to inspire us today as well. My friend Arthur Brooks and I are gonna have a conversation. I appreciate you being here. Todd Rose, Angela Duckworth, Saul Khan, David Coleman, Diane Tabiner, former Secretaries of Education, Bill Bennett, Rod Page, and Arnie Duncan, and many others. We really appreciate all of them coming as well. Now to start off, we all know that education has the power to alter lives, to unleash potential, and to free people from poverty. And yet, we let so many children born with the potential to succeed walk out of our nation's classrooms with that potential unmet. The continuing widening of the opportunity gap in America couldn't come at a worse time. Rapid technological innovation in the last two decades has created massive disruption in our society. And for those that are living well, we don't necessarily sense it each and every day. But as you saw the election play out, this last election of great angst that people felt, there's a reason why people are, are anxious. There's a reason why they're angry. The basic institutions in their lives don't work the way they used to work 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. 
Education being front and center, one of those that truly matters. Jobs are being automated daily, and many workers don't have the skills and knowledge to compete for the openings in a really extraordinarily competitive 21st century world economy. That gulf will only grow. The world is moving faster than ever, and it's just getting exponentially faster each and every day. And yet we have a system in place that was designed for another space and time. Tech and data companies estimate that data production will reach 44 times what was produced this year compared to 2009. A report by the Pew Research Center showed an overwhelming consensus among experts that artificial intelligence and robotics will become such an integral part of our lives and workplaces over the next four, five to 10 years, some of which will be great, but it'll also create disruptions where if you're born poor in this country and you don't have a chance to uh, access a quality education, you may never get a job at all. That's the world we're moving towards. And it's not just people trapped in poverty. A study out last year by McKinsey and company forecasted that nearly half of the jobs American workers are paid to perform today, representing $2 trillion of wages, could be automated in the next five to 10 years in some fashion. Yet today, only a third of our children are college and or career ready after we spend more per student than any country other than, uh, other than a few of uh, the Benelux countries. Arthur, you'll appreciate this. During the campaign, I made this statement, and when you're a candidate, everything's digitized, and so there's like a little jury. Um, I think it's the Washington Post or one of these newspapers. They have a little, they're judges, and they, they politifact you. I got politifacted when I said we spend more per student than any country in the world, and they said, no, no, it's a four-alarm, hair-on-fire lie that that's the case because Belgium and Luxembourg spend more than the United States. Tell, that's like a rounding error. That's like a half a date county in terms of number of students. <laughs> the simple fact is, I don't want to be politifacted anymore, we spend a lot of money per student. And yet a third of our children are college and or career ready. One of the biggest roadblocks to systemic reform of our education system is bureaucratic resistance to change. What we're seeing, for those familiar with the old school Star Wars, since the new school, new movies are coming out, is the empire strikes back, and it does it each and every day. It's an empire consisting of thir over 13,000 politicized, unionized bureaucracies called school districts. Many of, many of the people in the system are phenomenal people working their hearts out, but monopolies don't, re don't they resist change. They don't, they don't move to, the, to where we need to be. They try to block school choice initiatives each and every day. They try to water down accountability provisions each and every day. They push to lower expectations for students to inflate the perception of their own success. They're running out the clock on our kids in the courts, in the legislatures, in school districts, in political campaigns. And now for the first time, we're seeing them undercut families in collective bargaining agreements. The Chicago Public Schools and the Chicago Teachers Union have taken the unprecedented step to cap, put a cap on the number of charter schools in a labor agreement. The Chicago Tribune weighed in on this with an editorial calling the deal unforgivable and one that would squander academic opportunities for kids stuck in lousy schools. Here's the reality. The Chicago Public School District is teetering on bankruptcy. It's borrowing to cover operating costs. Its bonds are junk and its enrollment is declining. The debt load now amounts to a staggering $38,000 per student. And now to temporarily prop up this failing enterprise, children are being used as part of a bailout package. To the system, they're not individuals worthy of the best education available. They're funding sources to be procured. Well, if we're gonna win this fight of education reform, we need to stop talking about this in financial terms and start talking about it in moral terms. This is an extraordinary country, and we're not acting extraordinary when we leave kids behind. If knowledge was the priority in public education, every state would be chasing after higher performing charter schools, particularly in areas where traditional schools were failing kids. We would see children giving, given the opportunity to, uh, to attend private schools that better met their needs, 
to better ensure their success. And in fact, what we would be doing is redefining public education as educating students, not focused on the system, but focusing on customizing the learning experience for each and every child. We would see standards set for all children that prepare them for success after high school. We would demand that those standards be met, that they be met at the local level, but that they be met, with that we have high, lofty expectations for every kid. We would see parents given school report cards that didn't hide failure and mediocrity. And we would see a system in which learning was the constant and classroom time was the variable, that we customize the learning experience so that each and every child could reach their God-given ability. Choice, innovation, and transparency have transformed practically every aspect of our lives, and yet our schools remain artifacts of another century. The obstacles in front of us are great, but not insurmountable. We can topple the empire. We can strike back. One of our great achievements in Florida was the tax credit scholarship program, which provides school choice to low-income families. Opponents are challenging the program in the courts, attempting to block it and kick out more than 90,000 children out of schools chosen by their parents. And Tal, the NAACP, is part of that suit, along with the ACLU and, and the other likely suspects. Earlier this year, led by Martin Luther King III, more than 10,000 people marched on Tallahassee in support of these scholarships. Because this is about justice, Mr. King said. This is about freedom, the freedom to choose what's best for your family and your child most importantly. Trust me, their voices are being heard. Thankfully, in this coming year, there's a lot of excitement in Washington, D.C. This new administration and new Congress have the real opportunity to bring wholesale disruption to education in America. They can start by lifting the federal government's heavy hand in setting education policy. The real place for change is in the states, and the real power should be with parents. As new leadership comes to Washington, here are the top priorities. I hope that the new administration and education reformers in Congress uh, pursue, and I hope they're bold about this. First, I hope they cut the strings that come with federal education funding and allow states to innovate with those dollars. I always remember someone, I asked someone in the Department of Education in Florida, how many people work in the department to, com to comply with federal rules? 80% of all the people in the State Department of Education in Florida, and my guess is it's across the, across the country, it's the exact same thing, 80% of the people working there we're taking care of filling out the forms to get 10% of the money. This is the time to change that, to trust states to make the decisions. We should allow states to, to direct more federal dollars into charter schools or any schools where teachers are succeeding with our most disadvantaged students. We should allow states to expand college savings accounts so that they can be used to fund K-12 schooling, create lifelong education savings accounts. In effect, what we should be doing is empowering people to make decisions for themselves. The best way to deal with this sense of disenfranchisement that truly exists across this country is not to empower institutions. It's a bottom-up approach where we empower families and trust them to make decisions. I reject out of hand, as I know everybody in this room does, that, that because you are poor, you don't love your children with your heart and soul. We need to reject that out of hand and empower people to make more decisions themselves. There are more than 20 early childhood education programs in Washington, D.C., full of all sorts of forms to fill out, all sorts of rules, all sorts of empowering, discreet, unique little, little programs, some of which I'm sure are great. But wouldn't it be better just to send that money back to the states, allow them to work on the, the early childhood literacy programs that many people in our states are very passionate about, hold them to account with a focus on making sure that children are ready to go to school uh, once they get to kindergarten? That is a better approach. And this administration and Congress have a chance to transform our education system there as well. Top-down funding empowers institutions and enables the status quo. Grassroots funding empowers people. And the good Lord knows that we need to start empowering people a lot more in the world that we're in than we do today. You know, I keep hearing that this is a big shakeup year in Washington, D.C., and I hope that's true. I hope there's an earthquake as it relates to education funding and education policy. 
And if that is the case, I know that the people in this room will take advantage of that incredible opportunity to answer the question that many people in public life have kind of given up on, which is, if we weren't doing it this way, how would we do it? Isn't that what gives you joy in public service for those that are here in service of others? To be able to say, let's do it differently. Let's make it more relevant for the people that we truly have a heart for. Let's empower them to make decisions for themselves and watch this country grow and prosper. It is a worthy cause. And you all are going to be part of a vanguard of reform that I'm excited to be a part of and look forward to working with you in the years to come. God bless you. Thanks a lot.